Welcome to summer. <laughs> June 21st, first day of summer, not first day in Bereshit in Genesis. We've been here for a little while, but we'll continue on through another season and a few more after that, I think, too, before we hit the end of the book. But we're in no hurry. Although I would love to say we might introduce ourselves to Avraham and to Sarah and to Yitzhak and the one who is coming soon on the scene before we get to the end of studying them. Wouldn't that be <laughs> a kick? <laughs> but sadly, we're dealing with this time on this earth that does deal with death. We, we don't get to escape it here and now. I am so thankful for all of eternity. I will never say goodbye to another loved one forever and ever and ever. Right. I think that's pretty wonderful right there. But Abraham has a heavy heart. Abraham, in verse 1, has had to let go of his lifelong companion, with the one right at his side, the one who raised the Son of Promise with him. Sarah is the only one that we know, the woman's age at the time of her passing in Scripture, 127 years. And perhaps we are told a little more, a little of the detail and all, because she, in essence, we call her the Ema, the mother of the chosen race, because they will come from, from their offspring, Yitzhak, and we know it goes on down through the line. We looked last week that Sarah is held up in Scripture as a godly example. Also, I think why we get more detail in our life is she is setting an example for those who are to come right down to us today, even. Verse 2, we saw that they are that she died in Kiryat Arba. We saw that it means the city of Arba. Arba could be and probably was the name of a person, and through him, he was the progenitor of what will eventually be called the Anakim in scripture. We looked at all those. Versus the last time, we see that they're known as giants in Bible days, that the, that, that scared off those that should not have. Caleb, Caleb, and Joshua, Joshua stepped up to the plate and said, yeah, we're grasshoppers and they're giants, but it, they'll be like our bread. We'll eat them for, for a regular meal. Do you think they were Goliath's family? They, they could have been. Yes, they could have been. I'm trying to remember if we know the line he came from. He was a Philistine. Uh, it will, uh, let me say that for safety's sake, I'll say cousins, and maybe it was closer than that. Let me research later, and I will find out. And if you ask the last week, then you may have. Forgive me. It was a busy week, but I'm writing down Brianna King and Goliath. And I will let you know for sure next week what I can find out. Okay, but whether they were or not, they were known as huge. Everything was huge in the land of Israel, the fruit and vegetables and all that also. They should have looked at the good, looked at the cup half full, not half empty, but especially because they had the God who brought them from Egypt out of slavery, part of the Red Sea, fed them on every day, took care of their needs, water out of the Brought for two and a half million people. We're not talking for 20 people, even it would be difficult. Two and a half million plus people. They should have their worries. But anyway, that's another story because that's in the book of Shemot, our second book, Exodus. And we're only in Bereshit. So <laughs> we'll save that for another day and go on in context. Here we saw the note that Moshe put in because he's the one that, that brought all the books together. The writings that were passed out of him, he still weaved them together and gave us what we have. And that's why he's given authorship over the books. And he tells us that Kiryat Arba is Hebron or Hebron. It's the area that that's the name that was known in Moshe Fei, and that's still the name known today. And you will, if you listen to Israel News, you will hear about Hebron. Hebron, it is um, mainly Arab run right now, and there is a lot of. Um, Hot, hot, you know, it's it's not a safe place. It's hot, mm -hmm. The hotbed, thank you, for terrorism and so forth. So um, still not, not what it will be one day. Let me just say that because, again, I want to stay on track. But uh, we saw that uh, they had moved back from Beersheba, apparently, because they after Yitzhak was offered up or almost offered up on Mount Moriah, then it said that they went back to Beersheba. Now we're finding them in Hebron. 
Both of these cities are in the south, in the desert area of Israel. So they're not real far from each other, but we've just given a little more specific. If you keep in mind, Abraham was a nomad. He did not have a home. He left his home in Ur of the Chaldees. He came across to the land God had promised him, and he sojourned throughout the land, from the north down to the south. He's down toward the south, or in the south now. But I see him still with his flocks and his herds, probably moving as he needed new grazing area or whatever. But this was you know, the life that they had led. We do see that they stayed a little longer in places, Beersheba being one of the places that they might have even had like an inn for people that were going through that needed a place of lodging for overnight, needed some hospitality, may have been, but that's what he would have done. But here as we stay with our story where we're at right now, we see that it says in the middle of verse two, let me read it starting in verse two, but then uh, my point, Sarah died in Kiryat Arba, that is Heba, in the land of Canaan, or Canaan, and Abraham came to mourn Sarah and to weep for her. Mourn as the custom was, to weep for her, weeping showed sincere sorrow. He was crying. He's a man's man in my book, and he was crying. So all you men who are being told that it's sissy to cry, well, tell him to take it up with Abraham. <laughs> I don't see Abraham in a sissy lifestyle, and yet he dearly loved her, and his heart was aching, and he expressed that in his, in his grief and his crying. He felt keenly the enemy of death. And I call death an enemy. It steals from us. It takes our loved ones. We know that feeling to this day. And it's sad that mankind has to deal with that because it was not the way God intended. Had Adam and Eve stayed obedient in the garden, they'd still be alive to this day. Amazing. And I thrill through the time that will come when we will have that experience where life continues on forever. That there's nothing weak about Abraham and his tears here. He 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 needed to breathe. He needed to let out what was in his heart. His heart probably was feeling very broken, and he probably was feeling the aloneness of not having his mate with him. So he came in to, to mourn for Sarat, to weep for her. Um, I think there's a point I want to bring up, but it must be coming up. Okay, let me just say it now. If it comes up again, I'll just repeat myself. When it says come in, it doesn't mean that he had left her and he was off somewhere else. It could mean he could have been out in the field literally at the moment of her death. Whatever, it would also take into effect what has become the custom of the Jewish people of this day. And that is what is called sitting Shiva. Shiva is the number seven. And for seven days, the Orthodox Jew will mourn and weep and feel the sorrow of the loss of a loved one. They will not enter into any kind of joy during that week. They wear dark clothing. They turn the mirrors to the wall. They don't even want to see a reflection that might bring them joy or, or speak to them of anything else. They turn all the pictures, in fact, to the walls. They tear a bit of their clothing to show that they're in mourning. And they eat simply. They do not have big potlucks. And, you know, they, they just exist for the seven days. They are together usually as a family, and it, it's during the time that they're just able to cry out. And I'm sure that the, there are memories that come out of that time also. Where did they get this? How did this become a tradition? It could possibly stand back, you know, even further, but the only example I can give you comes in chapter 50 of Genesis. Since it's going to take us a while to get from chapter 23 to chapter 50, I'm going to. Um, encourage us in my tablet there we go i always my fingers do something funny that um i, I don't want us to wait to see it in 50 so turn with me to chapter 50 and to verse 10 we're all the way down to joseph's life joseph joseph is the son of very good thank you Sometimes I just like to make sure you, you've got the whole picture because sometimes we get so deep into something we lose the forest for the trees. So Jacob is the one who has passed away. Verse 7 says, Joseph went up to bury his father. And when we get down to verse 10, 
It says, when they came to the threshing floor of Atad, which is beyond the Jordan, Jordan they lamented there with a very great and sorrowful lamentation. And he observed seven days mourning for his father. Okay, uh, in our Jewish Bible, complete Jewish Bible, it's verse 10, in case if you were looking for it, sorry about that. But what it's saying is that they really cried it out. They were loud, you heard the cry. This is still Middle Eastern custom to this day. Um, there are even those who hire the mourners to cry at their, their uh, funerals or their memorials to show how much this person was loved. But notice how it says that they, they carried on in this capacity, in this way, for seven days for Yaakov, for Jacob, when he passed. So at least by Yosef's time, they seem to be sitting Shiva for seven days. Um, then, like I said, it could have even been earlier, but that's the example we see in scripture. So Abraham's in his time of mourning. Uh, we're not told specifically how long, but we know he's really hurting. And in that mourning, this is what he does. Um, he has to go on with life. So then Abraham, verse 3, arose from mourning before his death and spoke to the sons of Heth, saying, and I think is het in our Hebrew, depending on which one you're reading. Anyway, het or het is, yes, I'm sorry. Where did he come from? Het. Uh, okay, he's living in the area that they're in, Kiryat Arba. We're going to see who he is, but this is his territory, I'll put it that way. It's his territory, it's where het oh, lives. I mean, okay. because it's not mentioned up here where they have all these names. Oh, okay, okay. We're going to get all of that. I'm going to answer, I think, all that in the next couple of verses. So hang tight, and if I don't, let me know, okay? Hence himself, the Hittites that we read about later, when they go into the Promised Land, and they fight against the seven nations that were there. The Hittites are one of the nations that are there. So we know they become known as the Hittites, but where did they originate? They're from Canaan the son of Ham. So let's go back real quickly and see that in Genesis 10, because this is our beginning, and I think what will help um, Dora's question be answered in fullness. Genesis, Bereshit chapter 10, verse 6. We're back here where we're talking about the sons of Noah, you know, the flood, the rainbow, all this through for chapter 9. In 10 and verse 6, it says, the sons of Ham, or the sons of Ham, were Cush, Mitzrayim, Kuf, and Canaan. Okay, Canaan is Canaan. So right there, one of the sons was Canaan, was Canaan, son of Ham. Verse 15, Canaan became the father of Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth. So Het or Heth in your English is the first, um, is the second born, not the first born. Um, from Canaan. Okay, so Canaan is the father, Het is the son. Trying to make sure I didn't lose everybody. Okay. What verse was that in? That's verse 15. Oh, 16? 15. Oh, 15. 15, yes. We we like at six to get who who the palm is you get the and Canaan. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay, so Han has Canaan, Canaan has Het. Now we're going to talk about Het, who's been living in Kiryat Arba. That's his territory, okay? Now let me tell you also, archaeologists have discovered much about this ancient race. Until the 20th century, they did not. The Hittites were only known in the Bible. And outside the Bible, they didn't have records. And it's times like that that the world tries to say that, that the Bible is not accurate. Well, give archaeology enough time. You turn a spade. You know, the shovel, you'll turn a page in your Bible. And in Ankara, Turkey, which is north, they have found, oh my goodness, I don't remember, so many um, tablets and, and writings and recordings. Anyway, in these, in these, um, I can't think of the word I want, in these, they have the script, okay? I, I didn't want to say manuscript because that makes us think of a new picture today. But in that, well, um, we read about the Hittites. We learn more about their history. We find out um, again and again that they, that this 
family play a part in history. In the Bible, we see it that they were there. Let me give you examples. Esau, Jacob's brother, Esau, marries two Hittite women. You remember Bathsheba? The one that David took? Uzziah, Uzziah, her first, uh, Uriah, I'm sorry, these Hebrew names. Uriah, Uriah, and uh, Bathsheba's first husband was a Hittite. So we see them in David's time. They were in Solomon's time. We can read about the Hittites from, I'm going to say, about 2000 BC to about 1200 BC. That in our scriptures that go through that timeline, the Hittite people pop up, pop up, and pop up. That they originated from Nan, who was from Ham, no son. Okay? Okay. All right, so we know the people we're talking about now. We'll go back to chapter 23, and we'll see what happens when Abraham goes to talk to um, the sons of Het. Okay, I am in verse 4. He says, I am a stranger or I'm a foreigner living as an alien with you. Let me have a burial site with you so that I can bury my dead. Now, in the New American, it says, out of my sight. In the complete Jewish, it just says, the bury my dead wife. I really like the New American because it's bringing more insight into this for you because it's important that we understand when we get into the culture, but all why he's saying, bury the dead out of my sight. But let me break it down and come to it. At the time of Sarah's burial, Burial was to be done in the native land. Where you came from, that's where you would be buried. Even if you travel, they take you back. We see that when um, Joseph, Joseph said, you know, take my bones back with you when you go back to Israel. Now, I believe that was because he was prophetically speaking. They were in the land of Egypt, and he wanted them to remember, you're not going to be here forever. I brought you down to rescue you in the time of famine and drought, but you will go back to your promised land. You will live in your promised land. And I don't want to be buried in Egypt. They're looking at me like I'm an Egyptian, but I know in my heart, I'm a Hebrew, and I belong in the promised land. So his bones are carried back. Exodus 13, 19 talks about Yosef's bones being taken back. But for Abraham, there is no going back. Remember, he left Mesopotamia, he left Ur of the Chaldees, he left the land of idolatry, crossed over, that's what made him a Hebrew, and brought him, as he followed God, finally into the promised land. So this land, even though he did not settle, even though I told you just a few, a couple of verses ago, he's a sojourner still, yet this was called his home, as far as he was concerned. So he needs to bury Sarah in his home his homeland. I don't mean in his house, but, you know, in his homeland. So this is what he is talking about doing. You know, everything for Abraham and Sarah was for the son of promise in the promised land. That's where their focus was. So it would have been wrong for him to take her back and take her back into a land of idolatry, take her back, you know, to the heathen, heathendom. You know, no, he was showing that we that's been cut off. That's not part of our life. This is who we are. I need to bury her here. So he's looking to bury her near where she died, right in that area. Um, I think I went off. Is everybody hearing me okay? Because I'm hearing it go off. And I see a puzzled look on Roger's face. So I know he was already trying to figure out what's going on. If everybody's hearing okay, I'll just keep going. Someone okay. said you sound like you're in a box. So that's Sounds like I'm in that box. Okay. I got two thumbs up from Beatrice and a smile from Maria. I'm going to figure all is good. If you can't hear, okay, those who thank you. If you can't hear at any point in time on Zoom room, give me a thumbs down. Do an ear. You know, flag me down. You all let me know if I get too soft too. But we'll go on. I think we're fine. I think the Lord can give me strength to keep my voice strong. So Abraham's got to bury his dead. Now, I'm going to explain, but let me read a couple more verses before I explain what takes place in, in this play out here. So verse 6 uh, says, here, uh, okay, did I, I didn't do 5, I'm sorry, I don't want to confuse you. In, in 4, he's talking to the sons of Het, and he's telling them, I'm a stranger, I'm a foreigner, but I need a place to bury my wife out of my son. So the sons of Heth, the ones that he was talking with, answered Abraham, saying to him, now verse 6, 
Hear us, my Lord. Now, when they call Abraham Lord, they're just showing respect. The Hebrew does say mighty prince, and we know that Abraham was a prince with God because God is our king, and he makes us princes and princesses in him. But uh, they were just meaning it as uh, a respectful um, title uh, that they were giving to him. They say to him, oh, and here's your, you are a mighty prince among us. Bury your dead in the choices of our grace. None of us will refuse you his grave for burying your dead. But I'm trying to read out the two right variants. That's why you hear me stumbling for a moment. But I think, you know, again, in complete Jewish, choose where, what tomb you want. None of us will refuse our tomb. Choose the best if you want is what they're trying to say. They helped him in high esteem. They respected him. They gave him that title. They see him as a prince, and they're saying, wherever you want, carte blanche, you know, wherever you want. So Abraham stood up, and he bowed to the people of the land, to the sons of the head. Now, this is a bowing down, as was custom. It's just showing respect. I would say today we see men handshake, <clears throat> you know, but in that day, he bowed down to the ground, and that's why he tells us he stood up, that he... They were sitting and talking, and I'll tell you where I think in just a moment, but he, as a person day, he was showing a respect back to them. They respected him. He's showing that he respects them. Now, in all honesty, he knows God has promised him that whole land. God has said, it's your land. I'm giving it to you. And he could have said, hey, this is my land. You're the usurper, you know, this is my land, I'm going to take it, I'm going to bury my dead. But he does not. He doesn't show a disrespect to those who were there. He respects them. He realizes he's not the one who's going to fight for the land and get it. What he is to have, God's going to give to him. He's going to be the recipient, the receiver. He's not going to come in with a period, uh, uh, with a superiority complex and say, you know, I'm better than you. God's given me this land. You don't know my God, but you have to count out of what my God said. You have to give me this land. It would have been like a bully coming at them. And instead he shows them a respect and he's trusting God to accomplish whatever God wants, that God has promised this is what will happen. So they're going to enter into a little bargaining here. And if you know the, the um, culture of the, the world, the Eastern world at this time, you still see it, especially in the Arab world today, there's a bartering that goes on. When you shop in Israel and you shop in the stores that, that are very much like the American stores, the prices are set, you buy at the price you see. If you don't want to, you simply don't buy. But when you go through the open marketplaces, that very often you're dealing with um, Israeli Arabs, you're dealing with Arab Arabs also, but both sides, they want you to bargain. They're insulted if you don't play the game with them. You know, they like the interaction. And they have a, a price of mind, and you have a price of mind. And if you can come somewhere in the middle and both be happy, you walk away with the product. Okay, well, that's a little bit like what we're going to see here. So let's read through, and I'll keep explaining as we go on. So Abraham has shown them that respect, and he's speaking back to them. And he says, if it's your desire to help me bury my dad, then listen to me. Ask Ephron, the son of Zohar, that's a hard one in Hebrew. Zohar, or Zohar, I'll say in our English. So, plead with Ephron. So, Abram's talking to Heth's sons, but he's saying there's one in particular that I want you to talk to for me. Obviously, Abram knew where he wanted to bury his wife. He had it already planned out. He's just going through the protocol and the politeness. So, He's saying, if you if you're really on my side, you're that you want to please me that much, then go talk to Ephron, the son of Zohar, for me, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he owns, which is at the end of his field for the full price. Let him give it to me in your presence for a burial site. Okay, he has put out his plea. He's entreated. He's saying, I want that property. And I need you to mediate for me because that was the custom of the day. Ephraim would be the one that would mediate. Now, here's where we need to understand some of the culture and what was going on, too. He's told them he wants to bury his dead out of his sight. This is against the heathendom in the area. 
what they would do after they interred, interred how do you say that, interred. their dead. You know, they're, they're, they're burying their dead. But what they would do, and especially if it was a male ancestor, and I think at other times when it was like the head woman of a family too, you know, someone who they were respecting, they wanted to honor, they wanted to petition their household gods <laughs> that now they've got another, in essence, that's going to watch over them and be like a god to them or for them. So they would make little objects, I'll call them idols, because that's what they are, that would reflect that person that had died. And that way they're keeping that one in their eyesight. And they're in the eyesight of their loved one who's going to watch over them and make sure even in their absence, especially if they were a male leader, even in their absence, nobody's going to take advantage of this family because that one's still watching over them. Now, before you say, like, we do nothing like this, and I don't mean to step on toes, but if you're one who has said this, think, think this through and take it wherever the Lord takes you with it. I hear many a time when someone has a loved one go home to be with the Lord, oh, now I've got an angel in heaven who's looking over me. It's the similar thought, only they just didn't put that angel in heaven. They had that person right, you know, among them. So Abraham is challenging their way, their culture, their idolatrous ways, and he's not going to make a, a tariff is what they call it. I knew the word would come back to me. T-E-R-A-P-H. That's what they call a little image. He was not going to make an image of Sarah. He was not going to look at her as a spirit around him now, and he wasn't going to put her on that level where they almost worship. You know, I've got mm -hmm. this one. You know, he wasn't going to do any of this. So that's why he'll phrase more than once, if I remember right, that he wants to bury his dad and he wants to bury her out of his sight. He is setting forth something different. He's taking a stand in the middle of his mourning and his sorrow, in the middle of a world of idolatry. We do it different. This is not how we do it. This is not our custom. So even though Sarah has the respect we saw in the beginning of the chapter, she is still just a human being. She didn't become an angel up in heaven watching over Abraham, and he didn't make a household tariff to keep her presence there. He wants to literally bury her out of his sight. And I have to say, you're right. You know, that's what we need to do. Carry them in your heart. Keep the memories. Uh, nothing wrong with that, but keep them in the place that they belong. I have often seen also, and I'm not here to pick on people, but often a loved one goes home to be with the Lord, and in their real life, they might have done some good things, but they also might have been a real stinker. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, you hear all the wonderful things they did. You know, keep things in perspective, okay? They are humans. Our eyes should only be on the Lord. And when I opened the prayer day, I, the Lord just led me to call from El Gabor. That's our hero God. That's our almighty, our powerful God. That's where we live. That's who I worship. That's who I'm going to put on that pedestal. That's who I'm going to look at. And I'm not going to give anyone else sports, theater, family, anywhere. Nobody else. We're all together. Only lift him up. So... Abraham, even in his grief, is following, showing he has really cut all ties with idolatry, with the heathen ways. He is a different person than the, what lived in Ur the Chaldees. Yes, Rowena. I, I just like to share, it's in the history of the Philippines. We call them Anitos. The oldest and most respected of the family, when they die, they sit him on a chair on a, on a stone. And I don't know what kind of embalming they do, but they let them sit there to, to be forever like a statue before the, the family. So they actually dry up and remain like skin, very dry skin with almost bones. And they're supposed to worship that one or give respect to that one because he's the eldest in the family. So they never really get buried. They are on display as they decay. Wow. So you can really relate to the contrast Abraham is doing. And that, that's, 
You gave us a very, uh, I'm terrible. <laughs> very, I, I mean, what a picture you Grand painted in my, in my mind. <laughs> but that was history. That's not anymore being done now. But, you know, in some excavations, they find that these are still um, being seen. Right. Look at the Egyptians. They <clears throat> mummify them. You can still walk by Stalin and see him laying in, in a tomb thing, you know, bed thing. I've got such a right book. Sarcophagus. Sarcophagus, yes. But it's clear yeah. when they can see through it, yeah. <laughs> <sighs> I saw yeah. one of those in the Catholic Church. Yes, <clears throat> you, you can. I thought... Am I seeing? Somebody was laying in it. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And you know what you just made me think when you took me there. And again, I'm not here to bash. That's not my point. But in the Catholic religion, they have Jesus on the cross, you know, in death. Well, I can almost see where the Philippine culture, you know, they, they're looking up at that one. You know? So, wow. I am so thankful when I think about my loved ones, I'm picturing them in heaven. Not down here and not them, I'll look at them. Yeah, I can see why the Philippines culture doesn't do it today. <laughs> but thank you for the insight, Berlina. So, Avram knows he wants to bury her. He's got the place picked out. He's got a place and he's called it the Cave of Mothla. I think I'm gonna go ahead and introduce you to some pictures. Did you catch my emails? I forgot to tell you. No. I sent you a number of pictures just so that as we're talking about it, you can have something in your mind. Even for those who went with me on the last trip to Israel, you did not go to the cave of Machla because it's in Hebron and it's too hot of an area. We, we even know the incident. Uh, Tom and Jeannie have been in the area very carefully and they knew the um, storekeeper that was shot there just what, a few months ago, thankfully, and survived. But, uh, so most tourist, tourist trips, tour, most trips, oh, forget it. In North <laughs> most don't go get to see this. I saw it, I was privileged back in the 80s. We were able to go. It wasn't quite as... It, it, Which one did you want? <laughs> start with the first. I want to go to the outside, go up, yeah. Go, no, 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 go to the outside first. I'm going to take them from the outside in and we can do all these pictures quickly. Did it not come in in order? No, just this person. Well, okay. okay, start with that one and work your way up. No, they came in the so you. This is the cave of Makala. I'm sorry. Did you put it on our phone? Did you say anything? No. Oh, no. Okay. I sent it to him in an email, but sure, I can send it to you on your phones later. So, and there'll be a number of them, but Roger's sharing it real quick. It'll be up on this screen. And all he has to do is everything I sent him, I could see it got reversed. So just start at the bottom and work out. So this building, this monument that you see up the stairs, that's, that whole thing was a cave. And it was called the Cave of Makhala. We'll talk about why it's called Makhala. I'll tell you while you're looking at that. Makhala literally means devil. And it could have meant that it was a devil cave, it could have been because you could bury more than one, so it was a double burial area. Well, it wasn't a burial area until Abraham made it that, but it also could have been the name of a person, so we don't know. You know, but today, Mahala does mean devil, and I will tell you, that in, buried in here today is Abraham and Sarah, Yitzhak, Isaac, and <coughs> Rebecca. So we're dead in in Hebron, in south area of Hebron is what you call it. I think we were there with our, okay. our tour way back. Way back, okay. So they built and the structure. And Leah is also, um, Jacob and Leah are there. I'm sorry? So they built the structure around the cave. Yes, the structure's built around. I'm going to take you inside with a couple scenes. But it was a cave. They buried people in caves. We know that. It was a very large cave because all of these people are burying in it to this day. Go ahead and go to the next one. So did they take the mountain away from there? Because it looks like it's just something standing. Here is the surrounding map. When we read it, the description oh, in scripture. Over here. Oh. Sorry. Can I see it? <laughs> Patty, can you see it? Yeah. Okay. And it's probably on Roger's screen too. Well, I see it from here. Yeah, you can look on Roger's screen too on the table. Okay, remember this scripture here, uh, the, the description here in the scripture, Abraham said that he wanted the cave that was at the end of the field 
So all this area around that's now built up in its homes is just like if you're if you live in this area long enough, do you remember the orange groves and redlands? Yeah. And now there's so few and homes through there or buildings through there, same thing has happened here. Mm -hmm. It's all built up around. But this whole area would have been a field and this cave, and it would have looked more like a cave. Obviously, they've done away with it looking like a cave. Um, that would have been at the edge of his property. Okay, they so a wall around it? they built it. It's that's part of the building because they've made it like a monument. It's Muslim in design. Mm -hmm. You know, the Muslims declare Abraham is their father them. also. Mm -hmm. And the cave of Makala definitely um, is in the Arab control. Um, doesn't matter because they're not there. <laughs> mm -hmm. But that's why you see that that influence of the type of, of style that was there. Go ahead and go to the next one so we can go inside. And they everything's adorned. One of these pictures is not real good. That's still the surrounding. Oh, there's one more coming that's on the outside also. Yeah, that one and it will circle it. This I think makes you feel more like it was open in a field. That's the building that circled is the cave of Makala. But see how there's trees in the foreground? It would have just been open area, you know. It was nomadic back in, in the day. We're talking we're talking right now, today, about 4,000 years later. So <laughs> things change. You yeah. know, San Bernardino won't look like San Bernardino 4,000 years from now, I guarantee you. <laughs> the whole world won't look like it. Just maybe wipes off the map, too. <laughs> yes. Okay, now we're going inside. This is one of the, um, and I've been fighting for the word, it's built over where they have Abraham buried. They have these hats, I'll call it, um, over. At Abraham and Sarah. In, in, in the past, it has been also that way for Isaac and for Rebecca. I don't know if it was for Jacob and Leah or not, but go to the next one inside of that, and you don't go in. That's just built over if you can peek through a window, and, and you could at times in the past see. Uh, oh, and here's just another. You can see two in there. That's why I like this because Machpala, double, this makes sense to me as a double grave. So I tend to think it might have been more the description of the grave, the cave, I'm sorry, than a person, but I could get corrected when I get to heaven. And they go one more, and that should, okay, that's the tomb that they've done up fancy. You know how the old graveyards, you have the big monuments and statues and all that. That's what this is over. It can be green, it can be red because tapestry wears out and they put a new tapestry over. But if you tip off the tapestry, it would be um, rock-like because remember there is a cave. The cave was rock-like. It wasn't, you know, it, it's, what are the caves like all over Israel today? On the outside you see is rock-like. So if you strip away everything, you would begin to say, oh, okay, I can see how it's rock formation. I can see how this was a hole that buried their dad against this cave. So that's the end of our slide presentation. Hopefully that will just give you a little more insight. Again, Makala can indicate two chambers side by side. It can indicate folding or doubling over. Everything in the Hebrew leads me to believe that they were trying to show it's double wide. I that's a good way. Think about the trade of hearts. You know, you can get a single wide or you can get a double wide. Mako, I was telling, it's double wide. And God led Abraham to the area because he knew plenty more were going to be buried there. Abraham didn't know it, but he knew it. So he knows what he wants. He wants at the end of the property, he wants the cave of Mako. Now, is he going to just take it? Remember, we know God said it's all yours, but how's he going to get it from the people? Let's see. Let's go on and let's read. And we are picking back up. Um, okay, let me see if I can find it in my New American. I think I have to pick up in verse 8. Uh, yeah, at 7, he, he talked to the sons I have. He asked them to go in verse 8 to Ephron, the son of Zohar. Ephron is the one who owns this field, the cave of Machala, that's verse 9 at the end of the field. For the full price, let him give it to me in your presence. You're going to be the witnesses. Uh, Ephron is going to sell it to me at full value 
you'll be my witnesses, this will be my burial site. So Abraham is making it very clear. Nobody's going to be able to come back later and say he had no right to this area. Nobody can say he stole it. Nobody can say he's doing something wrong. He wants it out in the open. He wants witnesses. He wants to make a contract with them. So where are the contracts made? Where do they do city business? At the gate. From the gate. Good, good. You've caught on well, and we're only in bare sheet. <laughs> in the gate, so the area of the gate. Notice verse 10, now Ephron was sitting among the sons of Heth. Remember, the sons of Heth is who Abraham taught to, so the sons of Heth now are where Ephron is, and I lost my place, sorry. Um, okay, and he answered Abraham so that the sons of Heth, my tablet's moving, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I, I will find it in a moment. Here we go. So that the sons of Het heard, that is, all who entered the gate of the city. So Ephron hears the sons of Het are there doing the bargaining for Abraham. They're the mediators. They're the go-between. That's culture, the way it was done in that day. Abraham wasn't to go to Ephron direct. He was to go through the sons of Het. They apparently had Maybe they were like the mayor of the area. They had responsibility in the area, but they could go to the one who owned and they could present. Abraham wants to buy your cave. He wants to pay full price. So the, the bartering is on. Um, okay, and I got to keep my finger on my Bible. Okay, so they're in the gate of the city. Now, verse 11. Have I done 10? I've got to know. Um, okay, sorry, let me just read that. I'm a mess today and I apologize. Now Ephraim was sitting among the sons of Heth. Ephraim the Hittite answered Abraham. That's what I left out. I didn't, I didn't get to that point yet. Okay, uh, Ephraim is answering so that the sons of Heth heard. I did read that, I'm sorry. So all who entered the gate of the city saying, no, my Lord, listen to me. I give you the field. So this is Ephron speaking. I give you the field. He called Abraham Lord if you're lost because of my confusion. I give you the cave that is in it. In the presence of the sons of my people, I give it to you. Bury your dead. So Ephron has now counted. He said, okay, Abraham, I hear you want to offer me full price. No, 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 no. I'll just give it to you. And all my sons will know it and everybody here will know it. So if the sons can't later say, he stole it from dad or he didn't pay what he was supposed to. They had, you know, they had shook hands on it. They had a deal. Abraham needs to pay us. You know, nothing like that could happen. They want it out in the open. But is Ephron really being this generous? Is this a magnanimous heart, such respect for Abraham that he's really willing to give up a chunk of his property at no cost? And the answer is no, that's not what he's doing. This is the, the culture, the, the bargaining back and forth. Oh, no, I'll just give it to you. And Abraham's going to say, no, 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 I will pay you. Oh, well, what is it? And he's going to name his cross. So here we go. We're going to read it. There was a price in mind right from the get-go. Yeah. What? So verse uh, we will pick up in verse 12. Yeah, that read, yeah. Ephraim in verse 11 says, I'll give it to you if you can bury your death. Verse 12, Abraham bowed before the people of the land. So he's showing his respect to the sons of Heth, who are the mediators, to Ephron, to whoever else is around. He's just, you know, now it's his turn to speak, and he bows in respect, and he says, and I've lost it again. Um, but he spoke, verse 13, but he spoke to Ephron, so the people of the land, witnesses, heard saying, if you will only please listen to me, I'll give you the price of the field. Accept it from me so that I may bury my dead there. So Abraham's countered as he should and said, no, 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 I'm not trying to get it for free. I'll buy it from you. Okay, so Ephron's turned to answer. Verse 14, Ephron, Ephron answered Abraham, saying to him, my Lord, listen to me. A plot of land worth 400 shekels of silver. But what's that between you and me? <laughs> well, he's just done it. We think, we don't know it for a fact, but we think he just gave Abraham an exorbitant price. That he knew Abraham was a man of wealth. Abraham saying he wants to buy it. Oh, well, you know, the value of the land is, is how many shekels did they tell you? 4,000? 400. 
It's 400 shekels of silver. And then what's that amount between us? Between we, we're friends here. Yeah. <laughs> so as if I'm giving him a good deal because he's my friend. Well, Abraham knows that he isn't there to get the bargain of the day. He's not trying to do the best thing that he could do. He is just simply going to meet him and say, and here's his answer. Um, oh, I didn't finish Ephron. No, I did. Okay, so verse 16. Abraham listened to Ephron. Abraham weighed out for Ephron the silver, which he had named in the presence of the sons of the head, 400 shekels of silver, currency acceptable to a merchant. So silver was the acceptable change of money in that day. And Abraham didn't argue. He didn't bargain. He just said, you know what? I'll give you what you want. Okay? Now, by the way, I forgot to give you verses. If you want, sitting in the gate is where the government took place. And you want to see it later in scripture. It's in Esther chapter 2 and verse 19. And in Ruth chapter 4 verses 1 to 6. Both those times mention how the business was done at the gate. And I also missed the fact that in verse 10, because I wasn't catching every detail, verse 10 when it says that Ephraim was sitting among the sons, and Ephraim the Hittite answered Abraham, so the sons the head, all who entered the gate of his city. Now, some have picked that up and said, oh, he must have been a ruler here. If so, he really got an exorbitant price because he wouldn't even need it. He's got, you know, a lot of wealth with conflicting ruler, but it might not be that. It might be as simple as us saying, my San Bernardino, my Redlands, my Yucaipa, you know, wherever you're from, you just claim it. It's my city. So we don't know which way it meant, but he at least did have authority because he's sitting in the gate where authority takes place for the city. And uh, if, if I pointed it out in our New American Standard, three times he tries to show himself ignominious. I will give it to you. I will give it to you. I will give you the lamp. But he didn't mean free. He really did. It's, it's Bedouin talk. It's giving, forgiving. And so he's just merely being polite, exchanging with Abraham, Abraham with him. And this is the formality. But they're doing it in front of witnesses because it is going to carry the weight. So all those verses, we just see that politeness. We see that Abraham offered shekels. If we put this into U.S. dollars, okay, 64 cents per silver shekel was about $256 then. Now today, the problem is silver is an up and down market. And we change exchange with other, not just with silver. So it's very difficult. Somebody took a stab and said, well, it would be at least 10,000. I mean, I'm sorry, at least 10 times that amount, which would be 2,000. And I thought to myself, we don't bury our dead if you, if you have a place under several thousand. So I have a feeling this would have been more like 25,000. You know, it was just, it was an outrageous price. But Abraham was wealthy, God had blessed him. He didn't want to bargain. He just simply wanted to, he, he liked well enough where he wanted to put Sarah, that he was willing to just pay the price. So he, you know, whether Ephraim was taking advantage of his grief, whether Ephraim was just, that was his nature, we're going to see later when we get down to, uh, you call him Laban, I call him Laban. We're going to see when he's bargaining with his sister of mine, you know, what influenced him was money. You know, he saw money and he went running after more. So, <laughs> you know, you can't say a whole people are that way on the basis of sex. And that's what I'm trying to be careful to do. This was Ephraim's character, I believe, that we're seeing. And I do believe he took advantage that. Abraham says, you know what? I'm willing. So, death. Okay, let me make sure I told you everything. This was a legal transaction now. It would have been certified in the gate. It would have been recorded. And in essence, he'd have the title B. We understand those words today. If you have a title B and your name is on it, it is yours. No one can just come down the road and say, hey, no, 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 that belonged to my great-grandfather. It's mine. You're out. I can so business it has continued on in a lot of the same way. 
So now we'll pick up in verse 19. I think we've gone through the culture. We understand. No, I can't go all the way down this to 19. Let's do 17. Um, okay, so Ephron's field, which was in Mothpilah. Okay, so now they're, they're, not, they're, they're calling the whole area Mothpilah again. If so, then maybe it was the name of the person it was named after. Anyway, it faced Mamre. That just gives us another direction. We know that um, Abram had, had rested by the Oaks of Mamre when he was near Beersheba. So again, it just it's the field and the trees in this area. That's all that it's really meaning from there. It's not trying to tell us a different place. It's just the direction it faced face toward the memory, which was toward Beersheba, um, the field and the cave which was in it. So he's bought it all. He's got it all now. He didn't just get the cave. He bought the field and the cave. He's, he's got the whole enchilada. <laughs> and all the trees that were in the field that were within all the confines of his borders were deeded over. And notice it says deeded over. This is um, legal language. You know, this, this, this is kids. And yeah, as I, verse 19 in Genesis. Yes, in chapter 23, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, and so as I already mentioned, it will become the burial place for Abraham also. He's not going to die for a number more years. We still get to hang on to him. It will be for his son Yitzhak and his mm -hmm. wife Rika and his grandson Yaakov and his wife Leah. Who's missing? If I say in English, Abraham mm -hmm. Isaac, I, Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebecca, Jacob and Leah. Who's missing? Rachel. Rachel. Why is Rachel not here? Because she died someplace else. On right. The they she buried her somewhere on the road. On the, near Bethlehem, Bethlehem, mm -hmm. uh, on the, the road back. Yes. Yeah, so um, Jacob, in his grief, buries her right where she dies, and that was fine with him. And then later he chooses to be buried in the, the place of all his heritage. A lot of people read a lot into that. I'm not here to discuss that today. It's not in our chapter, and, and that's hearsay and opinion as to why, you know. They moved her? No, no, Rachel's still in the, in the cave that she was buried in. Oh. It used to be outside of Bethlehem. It's really part of Bethlehem now because the city's grown up. You know, just like, what can I say? I, I think you all know how cities will be a little distance, and then as they both grow, you, you yeah. can't, you don't know when you cross from one into the other yeah. anymore. Yeah. So, um, that Rachel's still there, the rest are where they are. And what I'm referring to is people will say, well, you know, Jacob, his favorite was Rachel. Why wasn't he buried with Rachel? Well, you know what? Ask him one day. <laughs> but I'm just going to caution don't read too much into it because it's opinion. And I don't think that he was saying anything. He, he, this was where his grandfather was. This is where his father was. This is where Rachel would have been buried if the, the timing at all of her death, if he had been in it and able, there's no reason for him to say, well, you know, I, I have, to, even though I've got Leah there, I have to go over here. You know, no, no. Yes, we do know that his heart was for Rachel. That was who he intended. He did not intend to be mean to Leah. God had favor on Leah, and she produced wonderful <laughs> tribes that we look six at them. today. Yes, yes. Six of them. they had six of them. Yes, yeah. She had the first. She had the first four. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. this is possible that he was buried with her in the end was because because he got remarried again, but he didn't get buried with her. His second third wife. Katrina, Katrua. Okay, you're talking um, Abraham. Yeah. We will talk about that very shortly. Okay. I thought at first, and when I looked puzzled, I thought you were trying to tell me Jacob had a third wife. No. No. I said, wait a minute, whose Bible are you reading? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Abraham, and we will talk about it because we're going to see a little difference come up in Scripture, and I want you to be able to answer it to the best of our ability. And it's coming right up. Let me just, um, let me get you, have I done verse 20? No, I haven't. Let me do verse 20 and then we'll pick it right up on the top. Because he was buried with his other wife. So maybe her burial was bigger. Maybe. Are you talking okay. about Abraham? I'm going to. Abraham is buried right where I showed him. 
Okay, Loretta, Abraham is buried right where I showed you, in the cave of Mahpoa. Now, when I say that they're buried there, please hear me loud and clear. They're not there. I know. <laughs> that was the shell where the shell got laid, and by now, 4,000 years later, there's not even, <laughs> you know, it, it ashes to ashes, dust to dust, yes. But uh, Abraham bearing Sarah in the land of promise is now bound to the promised land with this property. This is the only property we're ever told that he bought. And, you know, in essence, I mean, he dug wells, he had the rights to the wells, but the land was not purchased by him. And where he moved, we don't hear him purchase land. So as far as we know, it's the only place that he purchased the land. The rest, like where the wells were, probably didn't really belong to anyone. Whoever was in control had the rights in the area, and that's why they had the fighting over the wells and so forth because it wasn't established as you become more in the city life, you become more established. As time moved on, it, it gets more established. There are those that own the, the land now that will say, this is my land. But that's why they still fight over Jacob's well to this day, but it's Jacob's well. Yeah. <laughs> it carries his name. I think it tells us who it is. <laughs> but let me give you another contradiction to have a little issue with. Go with me real quickly to Acts chapter seven. We're going to look at verses 15 and 16. Okay, yep. Acts chapter 7. Does anyone know the big event that happens in Acts chapter 7? What is it? What chapter? 7. Acts 7. It is a key chapter. It is a change that's taking place. We have our first martyr. Oh, Stephen. Stephen. Actually, we're introduced to Paul. We don't know it yet. He's Shaol, but he's probably the one holding the coats of those who are stoning Stephen, which means he's the one who brought the charges against Stephen. But that's, that's inferred in the scripture. But we're in chapter 7. We're at verses 15 and 16. This is, like I say, an important chapter, but I'm going to bring out something different here. Giving the history, we are told in verse 15, Yaakov, Jacob, went down to Egypt. Okay, we know when he did that. Anyone want to tell me, when did Yaakov go down to Egypt? Uh, when, when there was a famine. Right, when there was a famine. Was this before Passover or after Passover? Before, I think. Very good, because Passover is when they come out of Egypt. You don't have Passover until they're coming out of Egypt. Okay. That's when it gets established. So just how can you keep your order? How can yes. you see it in its context? Okay, yes. so Yosef has been sold into slavery. It's many years later. He's been raised from the pit to the palace. He's sitting on the throne. Yet Yaakov and the sons have come down to Egypt several times for food. There's a famine and a drought that's been going on for years in the land. And if the people didn't come down, Joseph offered them, come and stay. We know they stay in the land of Goshen. If they didn't, they probably would have gone off into extinction because they were already down to just 70 people. They come out two and a half million strong. So you can see they, they, they even in spite of the slavery that they were under, they grew in number. But Stephen's talking and he says, Jacob went down to Egypt. There he and our fathers died. From there they were removed to Shechem and laid in the tomb which Abraham had purchased for a son of many from the sons of Hamor in Shechem. Okay, um, I think I think we're okay in our Jewish complete Jewish. It, it speaks the same language there. So we have a little bit of what sounds different in Genesis chapter fifty and verse four. 13. You can look it up later. I'm trying to not lose you on the way, okay? It says that Jacob was buried in a cave of the field of Machpelah. Now, here we're reading that, that um, Jacob went down to Egypt. There they were moved to Shechem late in the tomb, which Abraham purchased for a son of money from the sons of Hamor in Shechem. Shechem's up north, uh, Samaria area, and, you know, we're down south. So, what's the difference, okay? Um, Joseph's bones were buried in Shechem, okay? That's Joshua 24, 32. So when Stephen is quoting here that our fathers died, he wasn't meaning that every father, the grandfather, the father, the, you know, he wasn't meaning every single one 
was buried, but he does refer to one who was buried in Shechem, Joshua 24, Yeshua 24, and verse 32, tells us Joseph's bones. Remember when I told you, he, he told the children of Israel, when you leave Egypt, take my bones with you, bury my bones in, in the land. So Joseph's bones didn't get buried where Abraham and Isaac and Jacob were. He's the next generation down, but his bones, according to Joshua, when they came into the area of Shechem, they buried his bones there. So that fits what Stephen is telling us here. But Jacob had bought that parcel from the sons of Hamor. In Genesis 33, verses 18 and 19, that's what we're told, okay? So Stephen's saying Abraham bought it, and yet Genesis is telling us that Jacob bought it. Do we have a contradiction? Did you hear people tell you, oh, there's contradictions all over the word of God, you can't trust it? Uh-uh. Yeah, all you need to do is dive into the scripture and you will find clarity. You will find it never, it never tells you one thing in one place and something different somewhere else. Go ahead. So what the, that one verse on that chapter 24, verse 32. 32. Is that in Genesis? Joshua. 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 Joshua tells us Joseph's bones were buried in Shechem. And Genesis 33 tells us Jacob bought the parcel from the sons of Hamor that Stephen said Abraham did, Abraham did. Okay, so there's where our problem is. Our problem isn't where Joseph's buried, and we don't misunderstand when Stephen said our fathers were buried in Shechem. He didn't mean everyone, but Joseph and others would have been buried in Shechem. But what do we do with the fact that one says Abraham bought it, and one says Jacob bought it, and we're going from grandfather to grandson? Here's where Loretta started in on the answer without knowing it with her comment a few minutes ago. <laughs> Abraham's going to live 38 more years after Sarah dies. He thinks he's going to die a whole lot sooner, and I'm sure he's thinking with a broken heart, that he's going to live 38 years more. During that time, he marries again. He marries Keturah, is the name that you're familiar with. And in chapter 25, so we're not that far off, we're in 23 now. 24 is going to tell us about Yitzhak. And then in chapter 25, we're going to find out that Abraham and Keturah had sons. Remember, God rejuvenated Abraham's body, and he and Sarah had a natural son. <laughs> Isaac was not virgin born. He was born of the seed of Abraham and Sarah um, because God rejuvenated both of them. Well, Abraham apparently, when God rejuvenated him, it didn't go away <laughs> because he has six more sons. And that's just what we're being told. He might have had more than that, where the daughters, you know, I don't know, but he at least had the six sons. So he's got a whole other family to consider when he's got to bury them, okay? It's not just Sarah anymore. Now he's got a wife and six sons, okay? It's quite possible that what he did, because remember, he's nomadic, he moves around, it's quite possible that he did purchase a second burial ground for his second family, that they were living up north, you know, in the Shechem area, and that he did buy this land in Shechem. Or, or, you know, in the area called Shechem. That was where the first altar Abraham made to the Lord when he came into the land. The first time we read about uh, building an altar, which is chapter 12. Remember 12, verse 3, God told him to go. By verses 6 and 7, he's built an altar in the land. That's Shechem. So I would think that was a special place to Abraham. That was the first place when he knew he was in the land that God promised him and he was worshiping and honoring God. So I can see if it was good farm land, you know, it has the herbs. I could see that he's gone up there. You can even just think in your mind. And again, I mean, when we get home, we can ask all kinds of questions if we still wonder. But Abraham, the area now in Beersheba and heaven, all that is just heavily going to remind him of Sarah and his loss there. He's going to start a new life with Katori. He's not going to stay just in the same area. Maybe that's the reason. Maybe it was because he was nomadic, but whatever. It's very easy to believe that he went back up into the Shechem area, that he did purchase land for burial because somebody in that time died. 
and they were buried there. Now, Keturah and her sons being much younger because Keturah was not 90 years old and God rejuvenated her. She was young enough, she had the six sons. Um, very possibly after Abraham had passed away, he's buried in the cave of Machpelah, which is where he was to be buried. Whether Keturah liked it or not, that was fact and was to be done, and it was. But Keturah and her sons, it could have been in her generation, it could have been in the son's generation, it could have been a grandson. In that time, she very likely lost possession of the land, sold it off because she needed money or whatever happened. We're, we're, remember, we're only given an outline because if God gave us all the details, we'd never get out of the very beginning. We wouldn't get what we need to know. So it gives us highlights along the way. That if she did lose that territory, we know that the Hivites, not the Hittites, the Hivites, we know that they possessed this land. 85 years after Abraham had died, Yaakov, Jacob, comes into this area. Okay, so his grandfather's been dead 85 years. He's in this area, and he could have known, because they're very good about passing down their history. He could have known this land was precious to my grandpa. This land, my grandpa's second or third wife, whatever you want to call her, Keturah, lost this land, or, or the sons lost this land. Yaakov was in a position to buy it back, and that he did buy, he repurchased that land, and he could have done that because he wanted a place for his children, his sons, to be buried. And that would be why Joshua knew to bury Joseph, Jacob's son, in Shechem, because Jacob had bought the land. He would have rebought it from the family. So Stephen's referring further back to when Abraham bought it, when he was with Keturah and the sons. They lost it, and it got redeemed. It got bought back by Yaakov. We got an 85-year period of time in between there. Absolutely, it could have happened. And then you have no issue. Uh, what chapter are you in when, when you're talking about his second wife? Keturah is chapter 25 of Genesis. Genesis? Of Genesis. Yeah. It, we only have Abraham in Genesis. He's in over half of Genesis, but we only have him <laughs> in Genesis. We haven't told about, referred to in Hebrews and I forget where else. There's another book. I know, but I mean, did you skip from 23 to 25? Yes. Yes. Just to give you the highlight, oh. just to tell you, to give you the layout. Here's where Abraham is buried. Here's where Sarah is buried. But we, Keturah is not buried there, and Keturah's sons are not buried there. We know they had to be somewhere else. This was the area, it sounds very much like Abraham must have bought property for them. Mm -hmm. They got buried there. Then later, Yaakov comes along and says, that land, that was precious to my grandpa. Let me buy it back. And he gets it purchased back. And he had in his mind, because he liked the Shechem area, he lived there a lot, he had in his mind that his family would be buried there. And it truthfully came to be because Joseph, his son, is buried there. The bones brought up from Egypt and buried in um, in the land of Shem. Okay? So. No, but I mean, <laughs> okay, I'm confused. I'm because trying not to. I'm sorry. Did Jay, I mean, did uh, Abraham buy the, that place or was it his son that bought it? And I didn't. I, okay. I didn't get it straight to work. Okay. How did that happen? Did the son or the father? Buy we it? don't know who originally bought it. Probably Abraham, but it could have even been one of Keturah's sons. But probably Abraham bought it for Keturah and for their children, because he's not going to cart Keturah and her children down to be buried in the cave of Machpelah. So probably there was a death in the family. They were in that area. He's like, you know, this is a second family. I'm not gonna mix them with this family anyway. So I'll just buy another plot of land to bury my dad. And then somehow they lost the rights to the land. We see that happen today. People lose a home. You know, they, the bad times fall on them. They make bad decisions or they run into uh, the obstacles that, that, you know, out of their control that they lose, you know, a, a land right. 
and somebody later in the family can come back and purchase that land if it goes up for sale. So probably because, like I say, there's 85 years that pass before Jacob's in this area where he easily could have said, I know that was precious to my grandfather. I'll buy it back. I'll get it back into the family and I can bury my family here. So, and his family is Joseph and on down because, you know, they didn't know what was going to happen. They didn't know they were going to go down into Egypt and 400 years later come back out with those bones. You know, those bones were, that's all that was left. There was no, the flesh had, had um, well, they probably did embalm being Egypt. Um, I think it does say Joseph was involved, but anyway, still 400 years later or close to that, it was just the bone that they bring back because even in that day, they would bury the body, like I'm getting too gross for you all, after a, the period of time, and I believe it was only a year, they would open that and they would take the bones and they would bury it in a much smaller called an ossuary where a sarcophagus is body size, the ossuary would be a, a small, it'd be like your house compared to your dog house, okay? You know, just much smaller for sake of space because now you're not taking up the whole space of the body. You only need to bury those bones. And so there were those that that was what their job was and they would take the bones and fit them in a box and, and close up that box that was their new, and instead of calling it a sarcophagus, they called it an ossuary. So if you've ever wondered why those two words seem to be almost interchangeable, they're close. So was uh, Joseph buried in, in Shechem? Shechem. Yes. Shechem. Yes, Joshua tells us and that they where brought the, up the bones, came in. Remember, Joshua took them into the promised land. Yeah. And they buried um, Joseph in Shechem. That's Joshua 24. And is that the first one that Abraham bought? Yeah. It's, it's probably the place where Abraham had bought, that Jacob also had bought. 85 years between those two, but something happened. They lost land, and Jacob got it back for the family. Uh, what part of Israel would Shechem be now? Up higher, uh, headed towards the north area, Samaria area. You've got Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, so you're going up higher. And their shed is down is, south. Is that where Joseph went up to find his brothers? And, and he brought them food, and then he had he went, went to Dothan or Dothan. Yeah. Uh, Never mind. It's not that. I important. okay. I can Google fast and find it. Yeah, and that's it after next week. Right. Is okay. that close to Egypt where they no. came back? Egypt. The closer to Egypt is Hebron. Hebron. Oh. Okay. I should put up an Israel uh, now. but I mean, what do. When, yeah. when Joseph said, I thought he was in, in Egypt when he said, take my bones back. He was. So why would they go way up there and Egypt's way down here? Joshua was in charge. Remember, Moshe dies off and Joshua mm -hmm. conquers and they come in and the first they conquered was Jericho. Mm -hmm. Jericho is, okay, I need a map. And Roger's not here. I can call up a map. Roger, where is he? <laughs> <laughs> when you need to. Let's table the question for a moment and come back and we'll look at the map and we'll see because it really does help. If I had foresight, I would have put a map up for you oh, so you okay. can see these areas. No, no, no. I appreciate it. And it's a good question. So um, I'll just give you a couple more of my notes that I want to bring out to you. I think to make sure I'm giving you every, I have given you everything. Anyway, as soon as I can get him, and I'm sure he'll be right back then we will look at that map and we will see um it's easier to hold on to geography when you see it but uh, when joshua came in and they conquered jericho and then they go into the land and the tribes are given territory i'm going to say and i have to double check me but i'm going to say that um, the tribe had the area joseph's tribe you know to have the area that Joseph's bones got buried in. In Shechem. Yeah, in Shechem. I'm, but I've got to look that up and see if I'm right. Because I'm just thinking that would be why he got buried where he did. He got buried in the territory that was given to his tribe. Okay, so what tribe did uh, Joshua belong to? Joshua, um, okay. Joshua was of Ephraim. 
Caleb was of Judah. Did I just do that backwards? I did it. I think I did it right. I always mix up those two. <laughs> okay, let me write it down. Joshua and Caleb, one was Ephraim, and I believe that was Joshua, and Caleb was Judah. Let me double check myself because I don't want to teach you wrong. And I'm always, I get dyslexic on those for whatever reason. And Pastor Yoda is saying, Shame on you, Rochelle, you should know this as well as the back of your hand. And I agree with him. <laughs> um, okay, I'm just going to do the first one. What try Joshua? But he had no parents. Who had no parents? Joshua didn't have any parents. Well, we don't. That he had parents. He was the son of none. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and we're doing a whole teaching on noon right now, which is how we say it. Yes, I was right. Joshua was from Ephraim, Ephraim, and that means Caleb was from Judah. So the tribe of Ephraim is who Joshua was from. Ephraim. Ephraim, yeah. Yeah, Ephraim, if you want it from the Hebrew. So, um, okay. Yeah, I'm trying to see if I can do some what do you mean? Uh, Joseph's. Joseph's sons. Remember, he, he had a son. Oh, yeah. Son. Okay. Yeah. I, that's something I'm going to have you explain to me because I'm like, okay. They eliminate, eliminate the Levites and put. There are times when the 12 tribes have a slight different listing. Oh. The Levites did not get land. They had the right, right. tabernacle, but they didn't have land that they had to be in charge of. And that's why the people tied to them and they lived off of the tithes of the people, right. you know, what was brought in because their responsibility was the mm -hmm. priestly responsibilities, not to be farmers and so forth or herdsmen, you know. So, um, but anytime a tribe was left out, there was not a vacuum. Yosef, Joseph had two sons Son. that Jacob adopted in chapter 49. You read that of Genesis. When we finally get toward the end of Genesis, we'll read that. And so when, when we see a need for two, so to speak, then you have Ephraim and Manasseh and Manasseh both get a, and, you know, and a fish. That, that eliminated, well, just so to speak, the Levites and Joseph. Yes, but Joseph, Joseph was divided sons. between the two sons. Instead of it being Joseph's, it was Ephraim's and Manasseh's, which was his family. And yes, yes. So okay. leave these out. Those two are in. You've still got your 12. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But each time when there is a difference, there's a reason like that for the difference. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and God doesn't lose any of the tribes, and he has all of them accounted for in the foundations of the new Jewish lion in the future. Yeah, that's why there are no tan law strikes today either. Um, God knows where every single one is, no one's lost. And it amazes me since I'm holding up, hold, hoping to get Roger here in a moment. That's why we see, um, uh, why I go against when they say there's the tan law strikes. They say that because Assyria swallowed up the northern tribes of Israel. That was the ten. Judah and Benjamin at that point were staying faithful to the Lord. They had not gone into idolatry. They didn't suffer the consequences of deportation. Mm -hmm. Assyria conquered the northern tribes. A little later, Babylon swallows up Assyria. And by this point, Judah and Benjamin have fallen into idolatry. And they get deported by Babylon. So Babylon has swallowed up your ten brothers because they swallowed up Assyria. So Babylon swallowed Assyria, who swallowed the ten. Now Babylon swallows Judah and Benjamin with the Assyria and the ten, and they're all back together. You've got your twelve tribes. And James in the British Hadashah, in the New Covenant, that's actually not a copet. We call him James. There's a slight difference in the markings for that name. He says, I'm writing to the 12 tribes scattered abroad, the 12 tribes that are in the diaspora. They're not in the land because, again, God allows them to be kicked out of their land for their idolatry and their disobedience. He warns and warns and warns. We see it to this day. They finally came back, a portion of them, into the land. It's reborn in 1948, but you still have the Jews of the diaspora. I'm one of them. 
I'm not living in Israel. I'm in the diaspora. Am I lost? No. <laughs> Do I know what tribe I'm from? I got an idea. But nobody knows unless they've got the name Levi or Cohen. That pretty well indicates they're of that tribe. But God knows the markers. And when God calls up the 12 tribes in Revelation and says, I've got 12,000 from the tribe of Ephraim. I've got 12,000 from the tribe of Judah. I've got 12,000 from the tribe of Manasseh, Manasseh, whatever tribe. And he names all 12. I take that as much as I take for God so loved the world. Every word of my Bible is true. And if God says, I got 12,000 for me out of that tribe that are going to be my Jewish evangelists, he's got 12,000 out of that tribe. He knows exactly where they are. He knows who they are. He's kept the genealogical records. What's more, he made the genealogical <laughs> records. He didn't just keep them. But it blows my mind because with all the intermarriage, with all the mixing, with all the, the nomadic peoples, with all the traveling that's gone on through time, how has he kept those 12 lines pure enough to say, Rochelle, you're at, at, at least a majority of the tribe of and fill in the blank. So, well, I can't use me because I won't be one of the evangelists because I'm going to be in heaven. The announcements <laughs> are raised up in the tribulation period. But whatever Jewish person he raises up, he knows what tribe they're from because he's kept the tribal lines pure enough. He can say that one is from Dan. That one is from Ephraim. That one is from Levi. That one is from Issachar. That one is from Gad. I'm giving you the English name so you can follow me. Yeah, that's that good. just blows my mind. But then I hear DNA very recently come up with the fact well we know you know and they try to follow back and, and follow the lines to where they originated and it's the one thing public dna not biblical people talking the world talking says dna has proven the jewish race the people that we call semitic jewish all come from one of four mamas and when I heard that, my little heart just burst out laughing. You give the world time enough, it proves the word of God. Where do I, our 12 tribes come from? Four mamas, Rachel and Leah, and their two handmaids, Zilpha and Bilha. There's your four that produce the 12 tribes. Out of the 12 tribes, we get one called Judah. That's where the word Jew comes from. But the 12 tribes were all Semitic and they all came to be known in time as the Jewish race. So when they're referring to the Jewish race today in 2000 something, and they're saying they came from four mamas, they're proving that what we read in Genesis as soon as we get there is accurate. They're proving it true. Now, if you ask them in the beginning to say, where did they come from? They're not going to tell you, oh, well, Genesis tells us. They're going to tell you, we've got to try to figure this out. <laughs> so what did they figure out? Mm -hmm. Exactly what the Word of God told us. Love it. I love it. Rhonda, you have a question. Can you unmute yourself? And I'm going to try to meet it. And I'm also going to hope I find where it happened to my assistant. <laughs> uh, where are you? There you are. Okay, I think you're unmuted, Rhonda. Go ahead and talk. So you said the four mamas, the, that's Leah and Rachel. And Bilha and Zilpha. Bilha was Rachel's handmaid. When she wasn't producing children, she gave her handmaid to Jacob and said, have children in my name. The same way Sarah said with Hagar, Abraham, have a child. She'll, the child will be mine because they're only their handmaids. So they didn't have rights as their own people, but they would have that privilege of having a, a baby, and yet the baby would be, the, the father would be Jacob. The mother is, is Zilpha, or Bilha. Zilpha was Leah's handmaid. Bilha was Rachel's handmaid. Um, ask me what chapter, and I'll go hunt when we get down to them. We're a little ways off from Jacob, so it's coming. So how do we know what their DNA is? How do they know any of these DNA things that they come up with now? I don't really have the answer to that. I'm getting the hand out of your face, Rhonda. Sorry. Um, I don't know how they get that. 
through the lines, that they're able to follow the markings and the, the area that, that they came from, and they're able to say, and they cannot say definitively which of the four mamas. They just know it's one of those four mamas. So somehow they have worked their way back to say this is where this all came from. And we know that, that there's four different lines that we're seeing. And that's all they'll say. They won't name them. The Bible names them. They'll just say, well, we just know there's four lines that we're seeing that make up what we call the Jewish people today. That they've got to have those markers or whatever it is in their, in their DNA makeup. Then we know they came through one of those four. So if your DNA makeup doesn't have that, whatever it is that designates one of these four, then you're not Jewish. Yeah, so that, that's how they know. Um, but I don't know, techni technically, you know, I can't do any better on DNA than that. Is this hope that his, that Walter's coming? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Amy. Roger, if you're here, we need a map of Israel up, please. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, let me see while he's getting it up. Um, I want a map that doesn't show too much detail. Oh. We want to be able to see Shechem in the north, and we want to see Hebron, Hebron in the south. I would say ask for a map in Bible times rather than today, because today is going to have a thousand long. Canaan? Uh, Canaan may go back too far. We call it a map of Canaan. Well, what area is it? It is Canaan, yes. It, the land of Canaan, Canaan, is what becomes the land of Israel, only Israel was promised much more, that they never got all of it. They will. How do you store all that music? I know how to store it. I feel like I'm doing a lousy job. <laughs> but it's, it's, I've studied this for years, I guess. I, I give the credit to the Lord, though. Um, and let me just say, while he's getting that up there, um, the only death that we're told about, out of all of these that we've been talking about, is Joseph. We're told that others died, that Joseph would get told that his bones get taken up. And Joseph, at his death, was, we need a map. We want a map of Israel. That's what it's supposed to be. Oh, yeah. uh, well, no, that's a map of the books of the Bible. Somewhere yeah. it, it took it off. You just want a map of Israel in Bible times. That's how I would phrase okay. it. Okay. That, that should get it. Because, yeah, and there's a few up there where I might could pick one out, but try that first, and I think it'll zero in faster. Um, Joseph was considered Egyptian because of his high position, but his DNA will tell you he was from one of those four mamas. <laughs> why, did they, why did they eliminate Joseph? I mean, what do you mean eliminate him? Well, they put Ephraim and Manasseh. Because when, when God divided the land, he, he gave it to, you know, oh. Joseph's buried. Joseph's bones are going to be there, but they gave it to his, sure. his offspring. And rather than only one, when Jacob goes to bless them in chapter 50, mm -hmm. maybe it's 49. Any, I think it's 49. Anyway, Jacob goes to put his hand on the elder right. to get the greater blessing, the double mm -hmm. blessing, and he's adopting them in because they were half Egyptian. They were Joseph and his Egyptian oh, wife. That they're being adopted in. They're being brought in to be part of the, the um, commonwealth of Israel. And when Jacob went to put his hand on the head of the eldest and didn't, he put his hand on the youngest. And Joseph says, no, you got it wrong. Right. He says, no, you know, I know what I'm doing. God was directing him. But Ephraim was the youngest? Yes, if I remember right. I'm, I'm, yeah. That's where you see my rustiness. That's where I wish my brain did hold on to it all. Do we have a choose? Oops. No, I don't. Want, work. I don't want a map of San Bernardino, <laughs> <laughs> which is what popped up on Roger. Okay, let me get close and see if I can choose one quick. I'm sorry. I hope this is of value to everybody. I don't want too much detail, but I've got to have enough. I may have to come back with it, but I want to at least give you an idea. I let me scroll down. Try. No, this is a New Testament. Uh, this is where the land thing divided up. Try this one. For me first, and let's see if that does it. Yeah. Okay. And if it doesn't, the very no, the first one say New Testament also. Okay, okay, here we go. I can see Samaria. So that's one of the ones. Wait a minute. Okay. 
This is one of the things that you have to guess. Here, okay. Hebron, Hebron is where we work first. Okay, here's your Dead Sea to give you a good foundation. When you're looking at a current map of Israel, you'll see the Dead Sea and you'll see if it doesn't, if it stops jumping on me. Okay, Hebron is down here. Okay, this is where Sarah was buried, Cave of Machpelah. Okay, then later we have the idea that it sounds like up in Samaria is where Abraham probably bought land and buried, uh, or whoever in the family, Keturah and the son, the second, were buried in the second, second family. There we go. The, the second family right here. was buried up here. Okay, not Sikor, oh. but Samaria area. It's Shechem that we're looking for. But Shechem is up in this area. It doesn't say Shechem on this map anywhere. Where is Jerusalem? Jerusalem is right here. So, you know, ways up and then a ways again. Mm -hmm. um, see, Galley is, is northern, so see, Samaria would be not middle, it's a little higher than the middle of the land of Israel, mm -hmm. but you're headed up north toward Galilee. And Hebron, you're headed down south, Egypt's down here. So you're headed down toward Egypt. Mm -hmm. Oh, I always think Egypt's up north, but it's no, not. No, no, Egypt is south, Syria is north of Israel. So oh, that sorry. house is Syria is up north, and it's Egypt that's down south. And then you've got Iran, Iraq, and if you keep going that way, you get the area of Mesopotamia where Abraham came from. Mm -hmm. Okay? Oh, off to the, the left, the right. The right. The right, yes. the left. Okay, hang on. Let me see if I can find a Shechem on one of these real quick. And then I'll see Galilee, it's too hard. Uh, maybe you can call up a map, ask for Shechem in Bible times. And if we remember this real quick, I think we'd be able to do it. So in the search, in your search bar, just put map of Shechem in Bible times. Hopefully it won't be too detailed and we can see the area around. C-H-E-M. Oh, C-H-E-M, you did it right. C oh, S-H. <laughs> okay, sorry. Shechem, S-H-E-C-H-E-M. There you go. And there, let's see. Okay. Which one's going to show me? My little let's map says it's see. called for the West Bank. Okay, here's Shechem, right here. Okay, oh, yeah. here's Shechem. You make it bigger. Okay, but I need to see more of the map. I know, so I'm going to the field oh, of where we were. Yeah. Okay. Um, yours says it's near what? Uh, well, I mean, you know how near oh, West Bank. West Bank. Oh yeah, okay, because it's the west <laughs> bank of um, of the Jordan River. Here's your Jordan River. So Jordan's gonna be on this side. The west bank is this side of the Jordan River. You know, so yeah, West Bank is in that area. But here's Shechem, here's Hebron. Mm -hmm. Okay, and what was the other name? What was my, our third name that we talked about? Mm -hmm. Didn't we? Because I didn't see Shechem. I was showing you up north and down south. What was I showing you? Oh. My mind, I'm glitched today. You were told where all the burials were Abraham and, and his yeah. family and his second family. But what names did I give you? We looked at Shechem, we looked at Hebron. Mm -hmm. Where's Dothan? Dothan. Uh, Isn't it? I've got to look up for that. Oh, that's that, right. I thought it was just below. And Ephraim, yeah. too. It may be. I don't you know. Well, Shechem, because that's where Joseph went. It's where David, David went. Or it's where David, David, David went. See, it's yeah, not David. Yeah. And, and Joseph. Okay, we'll David. do that next. But where did we look at on the map just before? Someone, anyone, my Zoom family, can you help us? What name am I forgetting? Maybe I just did show you the two, but it wasn't called Shechem. Maybe that was my problem. I was trying, I think that that was my problem. It said Samaria, but it didn't say Shechem. Oh, yeah. I oh, think okay. that's what it was. Okay, yeah. so now you see Shechem is headed toward the north. Hebron is down south. You're headed, you know, toward Egypt. Now, if Roger can come right back, we'll call up Dothan real quick because we should be able to well, go. where you're at. What was it, Dothan? He's yeah. trying to so get pearly because we noticed Dave went to check on the brothers and Goliath was in that area. 
he, he went to the area of Dolphin, oh. and so she's wanting to know, and I know it's up in, I think it's in that same area, but I just want to see it on the map. I thought Joseph went up there too when he was That's not very clear. There. No, when he was sold into slavery, he was taken down to Egypt. He didn't go north, he went south. Mm -hmm. Okay, I just thought he went with this. I don't know why, I thought it was the same way that David went. I don't okay. think so. Okay. Put it, put it in your search bar, Dothan, uh, map of Dothan. And if it doesn't come up, then we'll add in Bible times, but just put map of T H T H no, no, no. T H A N. Oh, D O. Oh. D O. <laughs> T H A N. Sorry, I was just telling you where you know, the English are getting off track. Okay. <laughs> Here's Dothan. Here is a Samaria area. I was right. Here's Shaka. So Dothan right. is north right. of Shechem. So it's going even and it was higher. Just, and it was just David that went? I remember David. I'd have to look and see if Jacob had any, if they Joseph. said Joseph had anything in that area. Okay. Okay. I hope I our Zoom family can see that. No, no, no. It's good to oh, have um, I can... And it teaches me to have a map and have a map ready. Okay. So, let me... I, I'll, I'll be a better teacher, Lord, helping you. No, you're doing good. <laughs> hey, wait a minute. You're good. Oh, thank sure, you. Sure, wait a second. <laughs> but I was really surprised because it was Jacob's two sons that went in to check them and they, after oh, they uh, did what they did. Yes. That was the area. Uh, so the area now. Yeah, so was that after he buried him or, or is it? Because the town said there was no men left, no boys, because what they did to them. Right, but that was the is that people that were or there before, or after um, Abraham, or um, what, yeah, Jacob. Jacob. Jacob's the grandson of Abraham, yeah. and when Jacob's in this area, it's eighty-five years later than what we're talking about. Yeah, Abraham. So, so you're talking about Shechem, right here. Yeah. So yeah. what happened to the the women in those days after their husbands were all murdered. They probably, I would have to see if I could get into history and find if it tells us, but I know like when the Benjamites almost came down to nothing, then the girls were taken in by others that they carried on the name. Um, so, but there wasn't a worry about carrying on the name because they were not Jewish. They were the people of the land and God allowed it, what they had done was wrong and God allowed judgment to fall. But the women Never probably were, were swallowed up by either surrounding cities. I don't remember it saying that they came into Israel at all, but I, I don't know. I'd have to go look and study. Um, that was really like sad. Yeah. Historical yeah. Records. God was angry about that. It caused a lot of grief and a lot of problems. Two wrongs do not make a right. And God really cursed him. Yeah, yeah. Zoom family, could you see the maps? Just now they could at once. Mm -hmm. Just the last one? Yeah. We so we talked for 10 minutes on maps when they saw nothing. Because I was originally just looking for the maps. I thought it was time to put it up. It was there. I apologize. What we'll do because of the time here right now is we will recap very quickly at the start of the next class. I will have a map up. It will have everything on it. I'll be able to point out exactly where, and we'll all get our minds solidified on that, and we'll move forward. I'm sorry. I would. I should have realized he didn't have a chance to share it, and I should have asked you to do that, yeah. but I didn't give you a chance. So that's that me. Good. This is where again. I think they tell me I'm a good teacher, but I could be a better teacher. Yeah, so usually we look for the map, then we find. I think the we all gave up on YouTube trying to find yeah. out. Yeah. <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. We're here to learn and to learn together. Um, You'll see, Shechem is right here, um, so it's not too far. Yeah, it's. No, I mean, and then, I, I never, I never look at this thing to see Egypt. Okay, good. She said a map showing where yeah. Egypt is. Egypt is south of Israel. That's who's Where is north of Israel? That's why Hanukkah. You have remember the history before they were always caught between Egypt and Syria. Whoever was the stronger would control the land in between. The 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 um, Seleucids were more. They allowed more than um, Antiochus Epiphanes. You know, when he, I'm sorry, the Seleucids were the ones the Antiochus was of, and he's the one that wanted, you have to do religion my way. He didn't give them as much freedom, and he caused, finally, we get our story of Monica. There you go. So, yeah. Okay, we are at a good stopping point because we really did do chapter 23. 
That just means that all of you who get my text, you're still going to get a similar text next week for 24. Chapter 24 is an amazing chapter. We have a type. We have what's called typology. We have a beautiful picture. That means that even though we're going to study what happened in chapter 24, it's going to be foreshadowing another picture. The same way we saw when Yitzhak was almost offered on Mount Moriah, and we saw what a picture of Yeshua it was, he was, the story is, that we're going to see another picture that's very interesting in what's called typology in chapter 24. So even though we kind of waylay here in the end, and I apologize again to Zoom for not being able to see it, hopefully you were hearing and beginning to, to you know, be ready to see the picture next week. You can go look in your maps on your own too. Uh, Doris got a great map in her Bible that helped her out. But don't miss 24. And because we want to see that full picture, I won't dwell on the map real long next week. I'll have it ready. We'll go boom, 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 and then we'll get into chapter 24. And I'll even tell you this much. We've got a picture of God calling out a bride for his son. Okay? Isaac. And we're going to bring that into chapter 24 in history, and we're going to bring that into another great event on God's plan through the ages. Okay, I'm tantalizing off of this. <laughs> I want you to want to come back. I don't want you to go away and think, that was a confusing class. I don't know if I want to be back. <laughs> I want you to want to come back. So are there questions? Are there comments? Uh, anybody? Anywhere? I'm looking all over. You know, by now you should know that but this class we just just go but i, I love it go the only thing somewhere. i really feel bad about is that we left our zoom family from the sink that's really the only thing i feel bad about i love the questions i love that we're thinking i love that we're learning i love that we're trying to piece it all together because too often at least for me everything's got a piece everything's you know and i yeah. need to see how those pieces interweave how they come together yeah. You know, I don't understand that there's 85 years between these couple of chapters, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. or, or whatever, you know, and I'll even lose fact. And that's why I will ask you at points to make you stop and think, who's Joseph's daddy? Because I know if you get enough time to think, you can lay it out. But now you're thinking, oh, okay, I get the connection. And that's why I like even what Anne's doing with Dothan. Let's find out if she's right. Mm -hmm. She wants to connect. Um, so you Jacob or Joseph there? Genesis 37, 13 says, And Israel said to Joseph, As you know, your brothers are grazing yes. the flocks in Shechem. Okay. Come and I'm going to send you to them. Okay, same area. There you go. She answered her own question. But that's good. That's important. And when we do see, you know, like we can say, Jacob came into the land that was the area that was precious to his grandfather. He would have known that. They passed things down. They passed genealogy down. They passed their history down. That's why we have the records we have. Adam wasn't alive when Moshe was putting the final touches on, but he passed it down. His sons carried it down. Well, Seth in particular, because he was in the godly line, he kept passing down the history so that we do have it. So um, besides, you know, what they were, what they were able to discern from the gospel of the stars that we hardly know. But uh, I think I gave you everything. I made you the couple of scriptures. They're on your cross-reference list there at the end of chapter 23 anyway. But uh, we are, as we move on, we're beginning to come in where Isaac's going to be more prevalent because we are going to lose Abraham. I hate to. He's my friend. And I, I never like moving past, you know. <laughs> but we have to, and we will. And, and, you know, we'll begin because by the time we get down to Jacob, it is, you know, many years to pass. What blows my mind is the ages. You know, you think of a young Jacob going to get a young bride. Jacob wasn't young when he went after Rachel, he was 60. Okay? 60? I thought he'd be 40. Oh, okay. I, mean, I think it's 60. I think it's 60. Isaac's 40 when he marries Rebecca. But if I remember right, Jake, yeah, I'm sure I'm right. Jacob's in his 60s when wow. he has to leave and he's going to get a bride. 
you know, we don't speak in those terms because we think with our age mindsets today. So, you know, we don't think of a six-year-old going chasing town to, you know, where the family came from to get himself a bride. You know, but that's how old he was. And then he was even older by the time he has Joseph. You know, time passes. So I should call up for his maps and timelines probably all the time as we're going through Genesis because it really will help us hold on to it. But for me, it, and then this is why I also like to read the chronological Bible. And I, I will warn you, if you don't like things moved around on you, don't do this. But if you would like to just see time as it unfolded, this Bible, and I haven't gone through it, and I'm not the authority, but I'm trusting them that they really have put together the right timeline. So you start learning about Job right in the beginning because he was at the same time as Abraham. And it cuts in the different parts of the books where they fit in. So if you have a book that's covering a lot of history, you'll see part of it here and you'll see part of it here. It does not give you a whole book. It gives you the chronology, it gives you the time. That sometimes I'll just go try to find my way, and it's harder to find your way in a chronological Bible to help me see who's relevant at this time, who were their peers, you know, who, what was going on in the, the world at that time. A chronology Bible will help you discern that. But like I say, if you need your books, all I need it in little boxes. Don't open yourself up. You'll get lost. <laughs> and if you want to see one to know if you're interested in one, ask me to show it to you. I have one upstairs. So well, thank you for I, being so patient with us. Yes, thank you for being me. patient with me. Oh, okay. Thank you for allowing me room to try to figure out <laughs> in my head to give you the right answer. No, I appreciate. And for still feeling like I know something when I feel like, wow, then you know, and not that I'm I don't want to be on any pedestal anyway, but um, sometimes I will trip over the easiest. It's like I missed the ABCs, you know, <laughs> or I, I didn't add right here, but I multiplied over here. You know, we're all, we're different levels and learning different things. So, no, I just appreciate your patience with me when my vocabulary disappears and I'm like, yeah. Or my mind just, I can't, you know, what do they say? Your tongue's wrapped around your eye tooth so you can't see where you're going. <laughs> <laughs> And being patient with me and loving me still and saying you'll come back next week that blesses my heart so i think okay then i didn't fail you lord let's close in prayer we can keep talking okay lord god thank you you are patient with all of us you are our father and we are your little children <laughs> and lord thank you that you are our teacher that you've given us a real quick to holy spirit to guide us and as I pray, let us learn all truth, Lord. So as we take away from this class today, may it not be a jumbled mess, but may we be able to solidify it in our minds and in our hearts and learn the lessons you want us to learn from studying these that you've taught us about through the scriptures. And Lord, when we see how much time you gave to cover Abraham and his life, we realize there's much for us to learn from there. We want to be called, at least I do, Lord. I want to be called your friend. I want to have that kind of intimate relationship with you that I read about the Abraham had. Lord, may we all walk with you and talk with you, listen to you, sit at your feet and learn from you and bring us back together, praising you for what you have done in our lives rather than complaining. And Lord, let us be a light. This world is so dark. Let us let the light out that they might see you and come to know you also. Use us to your glory in your holy name we pray. Yeah. Okay, mic's open again. You can keep talking. You can ask questions. I love questions. We all learn. 
questions. And, and I will tell you, if you're thinking it, someone else is too. And there's no such thing as a dumb question. 